true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with you. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. Dr. Michael Baden has been involved in some of the most high-profile civil rights and police brutality cases in U.S. history. From the government's 1976 reinvestigation, of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. to the 2014 death of Michael Brown, whose case sparked the initial Ferguson protests that grew into the Black Lives Matter movement. The playbook hasn't changed since 1979, when Dr. Baden was demoted from his job as New York City's chief medical examiner after ruling that the death of a black man in police custody was a homicide. So in 2020, when the Floyd family wary of the same system that oversaw Michael Brown's death, needed a second opinion, Dr. Baden is who they call. In these pages, Dr. Baden chronicles his six decades on the front lines of the fight for accountability within the legal system, including the long history of medical examiners using a controversial syndrome called excited delirium, a term that shows up in the pathology report for George Floyd, to explain away the deaths of black and people of color restrained by police. In the process, he brings to light the political issues that go on in the wake of often unrecorded fatal police encounters and the standoff between law enforcement and those they are sworn to protect. Full of behind-the-scenes drama and surprising revelations, American Autopsy is an invigorating and enraging read that is both timely and crucial for this turning point in our nation's history. The book that we're featuring this evening is American Autopsy, One Medical Examiner's Decades-Long Fight for Racial Justice in a Broken Legal System, with my special guest, forensic pathologist and former chief medical examiner of New York City and author, Dr. Michael Baden. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Dr. Michael Baden. Good evening, Dan. Thank you so much for this interview. Let's start off initially, right away, because of lot, we have so much to cover in this extraordinary book that is really chronicles your career and the evolution of your career and your entry into this fight for civil rights. Let's talk about your start. You say you were in 1960, you were working at Bellevue Hospital in New York City in the emergency department, yes. and, and you had a wife, Judy Ann, and a daughter, Trissa, which was one years old. Yeah, and you had two jobs at that time, an intern in internal medicine three nights a week, and also an assistant medical examiner and a tour doctor. Tell us a little bit about your start as a forensic pathologist and why you chose this career. Yeah, I graduated from City College in New York, went to NYU Medical School with the idea of becoming a internal medicine doctor, treating living patients. While at NYU Medical School, which was connected to Bellevue Hospital, the medical examiner's office was located in the basement of Bellevue. And I went there to see a patient that I had seen as a medical student uh, who, who died of a drug overdose and went to see the autopsy that was performed by the medical examiner and became very interested immediately in autopsy procedures and the anatomy of the body and the amazing way in which cells talk to each other, trillions of cells that all know where to be to make us a person. And anatomy appealed to me very much. So I began working at going as a medical student to see and participate in autopsies in the medical examiner's office. Now, unlike the hospital where people are treated mostly for natural diseases, cancer, heart disease. The right. medical examiner investigates deaths that are unnatural, accidents, suicide, homicide, drug overdoses, part of the autopsy information that's gathered by the medical examiner's office, which I found intriguing, fascinating, and uh, 
was very attracted to. So uh, I started working uh, as a volunteer in the medical examiner's office. They taught me how to do autopsies. As I, uh, when I got my license to practice medicine and graduation from a medical school, I became a employee, paid employee of the medical examiner's office, going to scenes of death. The autopsy starts at the death scene, as you can see on many television programs, uh, where the first thing that happens when somebody dies unnaturally is a uh, examination of the circumstances of death, right. where, where, how the person died, how the person was found before the body ever gets to the medical examiner's office to be autopsied. And I began as a tour doctor in evenings at nights. I'd be an intern resident at Bellevue in the daytime, proceeding with my interest in internal medicine. Uh, and in the evening, I'd go to scenes of death and on weekends, holidays, participate in the work in the, med in the morgue itself. So that's how I got started. And it was just fascinating to me to see how many different ways people can die and how much can be learned at the autopsy table as to what causes death and how to prevent death. And I felt that uh, with time that I'd be more useful to society if I became one of the very few forensic pathologists that were being developed instead of the thousands of internal medicine people that are quite good. And that got me toward changing from internal medicine to pathology. We go ahead, you write ahead about 1964, and you were chief resident in pathology at Bellevue Hospital. But this chief psychiatrist there, Weinstein, he called you. And so people recognized how ambitious you were. And so this was about the career girls' murders. What did you learn there, your first experience, I guess, in seeing how the medical examiner also worked with police and the prosecution in cases? So what did this Dr. Weinstein expose you to? I was chief pathologist resident uh, at Bellevue uh, at the time and working part-time in the medical examiner's office. And there was a uh, murder that uh, captured the attention of the public called the Career Girls Murder, where two young girls who worked in New York City and had parents of significance were found dead. And a black man, a young black man was arrested after a year long search, was arrested, claimed his innocence. And the police said, well, he confessed. At that time, and still now, when um, there are psychiatric issues that come up, uh, one of which is a uh, person who's going to trial, uh, psychiatrically fit to go to trial and uh, could uh, participate in his defense, the patient would be brought to Bellevue Hospital Psychiatric Prison Service. Dr. Weinstein was in charge of that, and he called me over on this case when they had we were investigating uh, the death of uh, the career girls and said, I want to show you something. And he showed me a confession and said to me, this is a typical planted confession where all the information is given to the individual ju just answers yes or no. And the police consider that uh, an admission. And this true was true of this uh, individual that his alleged confession about which they based the arrest on contained questions like, wasn't it uh, seven o'clock at night that you entered their apartment? Yes. Was one of the girls undressed? Yes. And that was, you know, about 30 pages of, of yeses. And he said, this is typically a planted confession and is not an actual confession. And I suddenly had the, the uh, understanding that not everything that uh, is done by police is proper because I, like all other medical examiners in the country, learn first about medical examiner work, working very closely with police and accept them as really guardians of society. And uh, here there were police who were obviously arresting somebody and claiming somebody murdered these two people on the basis of his confession, which really wasn't a confession. It turned out a few months later, that the real perpetrator confessed uh, and was caught and had evidence of the death and uh, wound up uh, being convicted. And the black 
young man, Whitmore, was stayed in jail for a long time, even after that, before he was finally released. And it was my first impression, really, that, hey, there's something wrong here in uh, how justice is uh, served. And that began my uh, concerns about the criminal justice system as involves medical examiners. Right. You say two cases emerged that made you question everything, uh, especially the term and a diagnosis called psychosis with exhaustion. This is the summer of 67. You were 33 years old, working full-time at the medical examiner's office. Tell us about Eric Johnson and Rikers Island. Yeah, I started then, when I finished my training at Bellevue, became a full-time medical examiner for the city of New York. And in one of the early deaths that occurred was a, a prisoner at Rikers Island, you know, somebody who has been uh, jailed there awaiting trial, who apparently got in a struggle with guards at Rikers and wound up pet being sprayed with tear gas and died during the altercation with police. And when the black male came to the medical examiner's office and had marks on his neck and had particular hemorrhages, little hemorrhages in the eyes that are are, uh, happen when there is death from neck compression, choking, pressure on the neck and cause little hemorrhages in the eyes. And this person died while uh, there was tear gas. Uh, Nobody saw the death. The, The three guards who were in with him and did the tear gassing had gas masks on before they did that. And it seemed to me that he died from choking and being choked to death during the struggle that was covered up by the tear gas uh, fumes. And uh, when the case was done, and the chief medical examiner, after the mayor had called the office a couple of times, determined that he had died of being overly exerting himself in the struggle listed on the death certificate as psychosis with exhaustion. The idea being that the individual got so excited struggling with the police that he died of internal biochemical reaction of some sort. And it was really natural death, not a homicide, which it would be if he were choked to death during the tear gassing. This psychosis with exhaustion has now turned into another term excited delirium. And that was my introduction to the close bond between medical examiners and police when civilians, unarmed people, die during altercations with police. And the reason they die is because they can't breathe. With Eric Johnson, the person who died, there was compression of the neck, which caused marks on the on the out skin hemorrhage underneath the skin, marks in the eyes. As a result of that, when police subdue somebody uh, who is not obeying commands, like usually they are persons who have psychiatric disorder, not taking their medication, or high on drugs of abuse. So the police called in because they're misbehaving. The first thing police will often do is say, put your hands behind your back so we can put handcuffs on. If the individual doesn't obey those orders, then they take him down to uh, put him on the ground and handcuff him from behind while he's prone on the ground, face down on the ground. While uh, pressing on his back to be able to get his wrists together for the handcuffs, often there's enough pressure on the back, prone back, to prevent the diaphragms from moving up and down, which the diaphragms are what uh, we breathe about 15, 18 times a minute because our diaphragms are going up and down. Every time they go down, they suck in air into the lungs. And every time they go up, they push air out. And that happens. That's part of uh, our life breathing necessary to stay alive. With prone pressure, that prevents the breathing. But the medical examiners, myself included initially, couldn't believe that the police would cause deaths of, of individuals in from the way they subdue them. And that's where uh, the concept of excited delirium was developed, in th- that the person died not from pressure uh, interference with breathing, but with uh, adrenal glands making too much adrenaline was the main theory behind the 
excited delirium, which is widely used by medical examiners, unfortunately, is junk science, but it, it takes the police off the hook. And that was, to me, a further development, a further reincarnation of psychosis with exhaustion, is that the police did not have anything to do with the death. That also came up with George Floyd. And my concern, as I learned about this and experienced these kind of deaths, was that medical examiners were becoming a serious part of the problem of how deaths caused by police officers are being whitewashed uh, by various diagnoses that are called natural. If a diagnosis is natural, like ex excited delirium or psychosis with exhaustion, that's the end of the investigation. Right. There's no investigation into anybody police doing anything wrong. And uh, that's how, as I saw more and more of how deaths during police uh, restraints developed and caused so much division, division in, in our society, the, the division being that most of the police are white and a high proportion of people who die under these circumstances are black or brown and lead to the kinds of social unrest that the, the death of Michael Brown, the death of George Floyd, Tyree Nichols, developed in this country, showed in this country. The, the division has been there, but it's now become more apparent, more obvious, and more divisive as uh, social media connects people more than it used to be that a death in Brooklyn stayed in Brooklyn. Now a death in Brooklyn it can uh, immediately be seen all over the United States. So, and I think the divisions that we're seeing, the racial divisions, have always been there in our country, but have uh, manifest themselves more obviously in the past 10 or 15 years since each death became more apparent to the community at large. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now let's talk about Attica briefly, because it's it we could go in, delve into that story quite a while, but Attica, New York, prisoners have seized control of the prison and taken hostages, September 9th, 1971. Now, a few days later, you write that the state police stormed the prison. And on the September 13th, there was a raid with 43 people dead, 10 hostages and 33 prisoners. You were there to do autopsies on the victims. Tell us what the contentious allegation or assertion was regarding these hostages and the prisoners? All the statements initially, when the Attica was retaken by uh, the state police with the deaths of 43 individuals, was that the inmates had caused the deaths. The inmates had uh, killed the prisoners. And the prisoners said, and the uh, families of the prisoners was, no, that's not true, that uh, it was the guards that killed the other guards, that 10 guards were not killed by inmates, which caused the police to be shooting up and killing a lot of, shooting a lot of, of the inmates. The inmates' deaths were attributed to various police agencies that were involved. The deaths of the 10 guards were attributed to the inmates, killed the guards, and that's why the police had to kill uh, so many inmates. And there was a dispute, and I was asked to come up and to do a second autopsy on all of the deaths, especially of the 10 guards. And my conclusion was, after autopsying the 10 guards, was that they all died from friendly fire, that the inmates hadn't killed any of the uh, guards. And it also opened my eyes to see the, the huge numbers of inmates who were black and brown that is the, the concept that was learned, was taught to us uh, by police as we learned about being forensic pathologists and dealing with police on, on, on all types of deaths, but especially homicidal deaths, was that somehow there's a, a racist bias built into structurally, I think, into police work that black people are more likely to be criminal, that black people are, are stronger, and uh, that's why police have to use excessive force to subdue black and, and brown people as built into the police structure, and that is uh, uh, adopted by medical examiners, we learn from. And uh, that 
then became my concern is that much of the problem, which is recognized, the division in the racial division in our country is recognized to be partly due to activities of police and also of prosecutors, but not to realize that medical examiners, that me, that my profession is, is also part of the problem because we tend to misdiagnose deaths that are caused by police and correction officers, by law enforcement. And then there's no further investigation as to how the deaths occurred and what can be done to correct the problems so that there are less racial deaths that occur that by themselves are horrible, but also stimulate a, a big divide now in society. Right. You talk about the Attica changed your career. And after you returned to New York, the calls came in from all, all over the country. And then case came up involving a person named Arthur Miller. And as we talked about in the introduction, you were demoted and there was talk of, and you were convinced to sue the city. By 1978, 79, I had become chief medical examiner in New York City. And one of the first deaths that I got involved with was Arthur Miller, who was a black businessman in Brooklyn and was involved with a an incident in which police took him to the ground, put him in the police car. He said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And by the time the car got to the precinct house, he was dead. And I ruled that that was death caused by the police. And it was a homicide. And the medical examiner who was in Brooklyn was was concerned because usually they would call that death blamed on excessive reaction to the um, police on the part of the neurological reaction, hormonal reaction that caused the death. It was a natural death due to the fact that this person didn't obey what the police told him to do. On that ground, I was then demoted the deputy chief medical examiner from chief. But what was interesting about it, shortly after my demotion, I got a call from a young black lawyer, Johnny Cochran, who was in California, who was wanted an exhumation of a young man who died in the Los Angeles area and was buried in Tennessee and called a suicide. And he thought that the young man had been killed by police by being strangled while in the county jail and asked if I would perform an exhumation on the body. And that's how I got involved with Johnny Cochran and a number of the leading people in the civil rights movement. And the reason Cochran called me was because he felt that I was a medical examiner who stood up to the mayor and who stood up to in, in the death of Arthur Miller in particular. And that got me involved in that, after that with many other civil rights cases. You contended that the medical examiner's office with this lawsuit, you wanted you, you contended that you should have independence and not be able to be fired by the mayor. Yeah. When I was demoted from chief medical examiner, to deputy chief medical examiner, I brought a lawsuit that couldn't demote me just because I didn't like my diagnosis, which was correct, that it was a homicide right. and that it was contrary to the civil service laws, which I was appointed by civil service after an examination of the highest civil service position in the city of New York. And I uh, sued and the, the court, the federal court ruled in my favor, and ordered me reinstated because the mayor couldn't demote me without giving an adequate reason, which he didn't have. He said I was a very good forensic pathologist. He didn't like my decisions and some of my decisions. And so in the federal court, I was reinstated. But then the city appealed. And on the appeal, the circuit court said, well, the chief medical examiner is too close to the mayor and shouldn't be protected by civil service. And uh, there should be somebody that the mayor could appoint and fire at will, which you can't do in civil service. And so took the job of, civ uh, of chief medical examiner in New York City, of medical examiner, out of civil service. And therefore, the mayor could fire me for any wish he wanted. And that, unfortunately, happened to the next person he appointed as chief medical examiner in New York City, who was eventually fired by the mayor because he didn't like what he said. And it is part of the reason around the country that mo most medical examiners are, are subject to being punished, being fired if they make diagnoses, especially when it comes to police 
deaths during police activity that the mayor doesn't like it or, or isn't politically benefit to the mayor. You talk about a, another case, a disturbing case, Ron Settles, that uh, Johnny Cochran was involved. Can you tell us just the particulars of that case and why you, you wrote about it and referenced it? Yeah. When Johnny Cochran called me to do the exhumation, that was the death of Ron Settles. Turned out I hadn't. Ron Settles was a, a leading college football player in Los Angeles and was about to uh, get a good professional career when he was stopped by police because he was in a very flashy, expensive car. This was Signal Hill area of Los Angeles. And it didn't look right that a black kid could be in a fancy car. And the course of stopping settles, he was arrested, brought into the station house and wound up hanging in a cell. Initially, the uh, diagnosis was that it was a suicidal hanging. Dr. Uh, Johnny Cochran was hired by the family, said he'd never commit suicide. He was just his career in football was starting and asked about exhuming the body in Tennessee. And the reason he called me was because he, he didn't trust medical examiners. But since he read about my being demoted because in New York City, because I said a police caused the death, contacted me, we exhumed the body. We found evidence that from the hemorrhages in the neck that this was not a, a suicidal hanging, but was a neck compression. The different areas of the neck that are damaged uh, with uh, hanging, the ligature is up right underneath the jawbone, above the uh, larynx, above the Adam's apple. In strangulation, uh, with manual strangulation, it's just below, just above the Adam's apple and causes fractures, multiple fractures of the Adam's apple, which is a thyroid cartilage. And the hanging, most hangings don't cause any uh, fractures because they're above the uh, larynx. Right. So uh, that's what I'd said, and then the family settled the case then with Signal Hill, but that's what happened with Ron Settles, just a, somebody who was clearly abused by police, initially suicide, that ends the investigation. Family hired their own independent expert who was able to get more information that showed what the police did was cause his death. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor. Are you aware that today can take up to 11 weeks for you to be able to hire for an open position for your company? If it's a growing business you're hiring for, you don't have up to 11 weeks to wait to hire. Well, if you're listening today, I've got some advice for you. Stop waiting and start using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter can help you find qualified candidates for all your roles fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. ZipRecruiter is efficient at helping you hire qualified people with their powerful matching technology. ZipRecruiter sends you people and then you can invite them to apply. Four out of five employers posting on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate the first day. So speed up your hiring process with ZipRecruiter. See why 3.8 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free, ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, you were involved in the formation of a new body, and this position, you said, had the potential to open a new chapter in your life. And this is the New York State Police Forensic Science Unit. You were working with Robert Horn from your Attica experience, and he ran the crime lab. Tell us a little bit more about this position that you said that had the potential to open up a new chapter in your life. After I was demoted from chief medical examiner in New York City and was then reinstated by the federal court, and then that was overturned, by that time I had 25 years of experience with the medical examiner's office. And I was New York City, and I was called uh, by the New York State Police 
And they uh, indicated that the problem in New York State for the state police was that there's 62 counties. Most are coroner counties, about 45 are coroner counties. And uh, the medical examiners and coroners didn't always do proper autopsies around the state. Right. And that, that interfered with the ability of state police to investigate deaths that were in their jurisdiction. And they were setting up a new unit, a forensic science unit for the New York State Police and asked if I could come and head that up, and which I did. I transferred, I transferred from New York City to New York State and headed up uh, with a forensic dentist, Dr. Lowell Levine. We set up this forensic science unit that was available to any county in New York State, in New York State, if a forensic pathology or forensic, any forensic issues occurred. And that was invigorating. That gave me a a lot more different areas to be involved with, to, to see all of the different counties and states and, and the cities in New, in New York, which is amazing. I was born in the Bronx, grew up in Brooklyn, lived in Manhattan, and that was my whole life before I got involved with the state police wow. and then moved up to Albany for a while and went around the state uh, lecturing about forensic sciences to the various police departments, part of the educational process and investigating deaths, all kinds of different deaths that I didn't have and see in New York City. We didn't see deaths in the woods, you know, forest woods and animal activity. And that's upstate New York that compared to the downstate New York. And uh, I was able to spend the next 25 years working with the state police, helping set up a new forensic science investigative resources. You write about an exciting event for you, and, and in its very vivid description about you were involved with Medgar Evers' internment. Yeah. June 3rd, 1991. So uh, just tell us a little bit about what you call a, a deeply disturbing case and your involvement and some of your observations. Yeah. While working now with the state police, New York State Police, back around 1991, 92, I got a, a call from the district attorney in Jackson, Mississippi, that they were investigating an old civil rights murder. Medgar Evers was a civil rights leader in 1963 when he was assassinated. He was shot in the back just a few months before President Kennedy was killed. And at that time, there were two trials, the 1963, 1964, that had hung juries. And in this the call that came from the district attorney was that they now had uh, evidence to be able to convict the person who did the shooting, who was uh, brought to trial. But uh, uh, in both trials, uh, he was there was no verdict because it was a hung jury so that it was still a death that could be prosecuted. Right. If he was found not guilty, that was the end of it. But he hadn't been found not guilty. And this is now about. 28 years later, and I asked, want to know, is there anything we could do to determine at this later date what the cause of death is, one of the issues in the first trial, and bring the case to trial? And I said, as I usually say in those questions, that for a medical examiner, burial is just long-term storage, and we can exhume the body, can't tell in advance how well the body's been preserved, but there's often additional evidence that might have been overlooked uh, during the initial trial back in 1963. This is now 1994 that we're talking about. And we did. We exhumed the body. And they called me because I was the head of the forensic unit of the New York State Police. And as a courtesy, could we help them? And yes, we could help them, help them. And we exhumed the body. And the body was in perfect condition. Amazing. He had been buried and uh, was uh, in excellent condition. So we're able to re reconstitute the bullet tract and go to trial and give enough evidence that in this the third trial, the perpetrator was convicted and sentenced to life in prison after it was about 30 years after the shooting had occurred. You saw a lot of cases where people died in, in custody, but you also saw cases where there was just a call from a family member concerned about a loved one. And then the issue of 
or the excuse of positional asphyxia. So you did examine cases where you were learning of all these, again, reasons for people dying in custody. Yeah, that is oftentimes, we try to remember, I, 50 years I spent working with police and uh, there are excellent police out there, but when it comes to a death during police activity, there's a reluctance of medical examiners to put the blame on the police officer. That's why excited delirium came in existence and psychosis with exhaustion before that, that it somehow is not the policeman's fault. It's the fault of the bad guy that didn't obey police orders. Sure. And that's where I got more involved in excited delirium and tried to give lectures and try to have that eliminated as a cause of death because many of the deaths during police encounters were blamed on excited delirium due to the individual making too much adrenaline and causing his own death, a natural death, whereas in truth, they were dying because they couldn't breathe. They couldn't breathe and there were certain... uh, mythology about it. The police felt that if the person says, I can't breathe, that means he's breathing because he's talking. And a person who can't inhale can talk, but he can't breathe. But that isn't part of what the police are trained in. They also feel that the person gets increased superhuman strength from this adrenaline uh, rush, which isn't true. And that's an, an example of Uh, why police use excessive force sometimes, because the decedent, the victim, is using excessive force. And there are these myths that are used to excuse and cover up, really, deaths caused by police, and that the medical examiners, unfortunately, are often part of that whitewash if they use terms uh, like uh, excited delirium, which is junk science, or terms like sickle cell trait. 8% of black people in the United States have sickle trait, which is a perfectly benign condition, causes no harm, but 8% of people, black people who die during encounters can be used to be the cause of death when that also isn't true. So that's the cause of death leading to natural condition ends the investigation. And That's unfortunate because we, who are doctors, get involved with the racial division, that the negative racial divisions that can occur in this country. You became friends with uh, attorney Johnny Cochran, and Johnny Cochran tried to convince you to become more involved in civil rights cases. Tell us about why he thought you should be more involved and a little bit about this what he wanted to impart to you about it. Well, I've met Johnny Cochran on a few cases in which Black people died, Ron Settle's case, for example. And he was just an amazing person. He's deceased now, but he was bright, articulate, just a beautiful, a nice human being. And there weren't too many medical examiners that he trusted because he felt, and I got to understand why, that there's too much bias, not only in the police, but also in medical examiners. And that's why he would call upon me from time to time, including... We both were involved in the O.J. Simpson case, which we spent a lot of time together. And he was, in in that case, it was Johnny Cochran's ability to relate to a jury, which is so important in criminal cases, is not just what they learn and lawyers learn in law school, but whether or not the uh, jurors like not only the defendant, but also the defendant's lawyers. He appealed to jurors and um, he was... Uh, The reason why I think uh, O.J. Simpson was found not guilty in the criminal case. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now, you fast forward somewhat to summer of 2014 in New York City, and police officers approach Eric Garner, 43-year-old, illegally selling single cigarettes in a very poor neighborhood, you write. Three weeks later, Michael Brown, 18-year-old, and his friend in the St. Louis County suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. This officer stops the two teens and tells them to use the sidewalk, and some words are exchanged. You write that neither Garner nor Brown survived their police encounters, and their violent deaths triggered national demonstrations against police brutality, as well as a debate about policing in the community of color 
and racial discrimination in criminal justice systems. And you write about the importance of smartphones emerging and helping society actually see these crimes, but also helping out medical examiners like yourself. Yeah, it was interesting. And, and was the use of the smartphone 19, in 2007, when the smartphone comes in, that you can take videos that there's suddenly one can communicate so easily in the smartphones. Yes. So that deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner at in struggles with police, which before the smartphone would have been just local, even Ron Settles and Arthur Miller deaths, uh, they were uh, localized. Arthur Miller was localized to Brooklyn. Ron Settles was uh, localized to Los Angeles. They didn't get uh, countrywide attention until the smartphones came in where people could video things as both of those cases were videoed and uh, sent around the country immediately. And I think what happened the, the Michael Brown was the issue was uh, whether or not the police officer should have shot him. He shot him, I think, six or seven times, whether it was necessary right. to shoot him. But the cause of death was multiple gunshot wounds, whereas Eric Garner died of a chokehold around his neck, a, a sleeper hold. It was meant to compress the carotid arteries so the person goes to sleep by cutting down the amount of oxygen going to the brain. But if you leave that uh, hold on too long, the brain starts, cells start dying. So he had pressure on his back, prone pressure while the police were subduing him, and pressure on his neck, like George Floyd had later on, uh, you know, years later. And it, it was filmed. The, one of the neighbors filmed the encounter with police, and it showed that Eric Garner did not fight with police, didn't reach out to hurt anybody, but he was grabbed around the neck and back, taken to the ground, and was unconscious and lifeless within 48 seconds. I say 48 seconds because wow. you can see that on the video that was taken by the neighbor, had a video, and you can see the number of seconds, mm -hmm. and uh, it shows how quickly death can occur if breathing and oxygen going to the brain is interfered with. It's like the George Floyd concern that was so important in civil rights matters became a concern because the way a 15-year-old girl took a video showing how ruthless it, is, it appeared on her, her video, the officer was, the, the, the officer in Minneapolis who had his knee on uh, Floyd's neck while pressure was put on the back by another officer and caused his death in a few minutes. While both of them, you could hear on the videos, sound, and both of them were saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Yes. And both of them, the officer said, well, you can't breathe, that means you're breathing, and which is totally wrong. And so that suddenly there's this grouping of cases that received a lot of publicity because of the smartphones and the news media and uh, that raised a lot of issues uh, as to uh, the racial divide in the country. And I must say that it was racial divide was always there. It's just that it was localized, even with O.J. Simpson. And that surprised me a lot, too, that in the 1990s, uh, the O.J. Simpson was 1994. At the end of the trial, the way the white community was devastated right. and the black community was very happy, mm -hmm. uh, even to me, has been around for a while. The division between white and black uh, citizens was was uh, tremendous, and uh, it's continuing. And that's and more of these deaths are coming to uh, note because of the cell phones. Benjamin Crump called you, and you mentioned uh, how important he was in in your career. He called you a Michael Brown, and you were asked to do the second autopsy. You say that the demonstrations uh, after this case united black and white. You saw both black and white walking in tandem together to protest police brutality, and those spread to 140 other cities and, and other communities worldwide. Yeah. And also, you were called in in the George Floyd case, and you open the book with George Floyd, and you end the book with uh, quite a bit about George Floyd and what was learned. And also, you, you comment, what if there was no smartphone recording that event because immediately to demonstrate everything that you write about in this book and we've spoken in this interview the first autopsy 
for George Floyd listed this as natural causes. And you were brought in for the second autopsy amidst all these incredible demonstrations in Minneapolis and throughout the world as a result of the verdict or the diagnosis, I should say, by the medical examiner. Tell us about your experience doing the second autopsy for George Floyd and Michael Brown. Yeah, it's interesting because we mentioned, we mentioned O.J. Simpson in 1994, O.J. Simpson verdict. And there's a clear division Whites on one side, blacks on the other side. By the time we get to George Floyd, and before George Floyd, Michael Brown and Eric Garner, there's a lot of white and black people together in, in, in demonstrations. And with George Floyd, uh, the huge demonstrations were mostly white people with uh, brown and black people participating, not only in this country, but in other countries around Europe and all that were that responded. And, and I think that the, um, the division, the number of deaths that were occurring and the coming to public uh, scrutiny has made much of the community, the uh, overall community, realize that there is a, a definite racial bias in how deaths occur in police, police encounters. And especially with George Floyd, what happened with George Floyd was that a young girl was taking the photographs. It was on television. And when at the end of the autopsy, the district attorney or somebody from the district attorney's office gave a statement to the press that the autopsy, the medical examiner's autopsy shows that the restraint pressures that were performed by the police had nothing to do with the death, that the police restraints not in any way, way cause or contribute to the death. That's when Benjamin Crump called me because the family was outraged. So you can see on television that the police officer is, is crushing the neck and uh, the other officers are pressing on the back and asked me to come down to do the second autopsy, which together with another forensic pathologist, Dr. Wilson, and we both uh, did the second autopsy and concluded that clearly the death was caused by preventing George Floyd from breathing. That, that way the restraint was done, that uh, he couldn't, there was no oxygen going to his brain because the carotid arteries were compressed by the knee pressure and the back pressure was causing, preventing the diaphragms from moving up and down properly. So no oxygen causes brain death and cardiac death and, and that the restraints caused the death, not that as the initial statement by the prosecutor and medical examiner was that they had nothing to do with it and that they'd have to wait a few months before arriving at a conclusion uh, as to the cause of death. And we went, Dr. Crump had us make uh, our opinions known to the press afterwards. And uh, after the press came out and said that we had decided, we had determined that the death was caused by the restraint the medical examiner then that evening agreed and said that was the restraint uh, with Floyd. But it was the usual thing, death during police restraint was, say the police had nothing to do with it and we'll have an answer for you in about four months when everything dies down. That will confirm our preliminary opinion. You write in the epilogue, uh, March 8th, 2021, first day of Derek Chauvin's murder trial, and six weeks later, the jury finds him guilty of second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree murder. And he was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. What did you see in this case that gave you some glimmer of hope and optimism, and also that was much different than the cases proceeding? Well, it was the first time that a police officer had not only been convicted, but sentenced to such a long term in jail that I was aware of at all, that usually in these deaths, there'll be internal investigations by the police department that will determine that everybody acted according to proper procedure and there'd be no criminal charges. Now, sometimes, as with Ron Settles, go to a civil lawsuit and sometimes the families will prevail in a civil lawsuit, but rarely is there any uh, punishment police officers. There was no punishment for to the officers in the um, in the first case that I was involved with, and the, the two girls who were killed in 1963, career girl murders, that caused the arrest 
on the basis of a planted confession. He eventually got out and was found not guilty. But the officers were not punished then, and the officers are not punished very much, even with Eric Garner case. The Eric Garner case that showed the officers causing the death of Eric Garner. But first, the city was looking into criminal charges against the, the officer involved. And then the federal government was involved in it. But they waited so long that after five years, the statute of limitations ran out. Right. And, no, and there was no criminal punishment for anybody in Eric Garner's case or in uh, Michael Brown's case. But I think that it shows that the public is more aware of the unfairness in the civil justice system at times, and that there has to be strategies developed to improve the uh, what happens when there's a conflict between police and often with, with persons, more often than not, who are mentally dysfunctioning. They're dysfunctioning because they're not taking their, their psychotic medications, they're, or they're, they're high on... Uh, cocaine or some new uh, drug of abuse. And I think that try to develop some strategies to improve the conditions, one of which is there should be a national database on all deaths in uh, police encounters and be able to determine how many are preventable, how many are caused by excessive use of force by police, for example. And they have to be trained to know that if, if somebody says, I can't breathe, they should stop the pressure whatever the pressure is, stop it. Because invariably, they're no longer a danger to anybody. They're trying to put handcuffs on a person. Right. And uh, they're surrounded by police, two, three, four, five police. They're no danger to anybody. Mm-hmm. Instead of continuing the pressure, they should be taught that they uh, should stop and just uh, take a break for a bit. And um, I, I think that from the time of George Floyd till now is three years. During those three years, according to the very poor statistics we have, there are more than 5,000 deaths during police encounters. Wow. 5,000. Very few of them get into the public arena. And because the only data is the Washington Post has been able to collect about 1,000 deaths a year of deaths during police encounters. And the state of Washington Medical School has investigated death certificates and finds that more than half the death certificates, the cause of death is uh, whitewashed in deaths and encounters, that more than half the deaths are given causes of death, such as excited delirium, such as sickle cell traits, such as undetermined, that whitewash the fact that they, they occurred during the police encounter. Putting it together, there'd be about 2,000 deaths a year about involving caused by police during encounters of persons who don't have weapons, persons who don't have weapons. And I think that we have to uh, work at cutting down that number, and it requires at least to get a a national database uh, and and see where the problems are. You also recommend that they should ban prone back pressure, chokeholds, and spit hoods, as well as restraint chairs, all of which you write impair breathing and can cause death. You write that medical examiners should be independent of, of police and prosecutors, and there should be a limit to qualified immunity. We didn't really go into discussing that. And another very important thing that we just barely touched on, the U.S. should follow the lead of other nations that have banned grand jury secrecy. You write in this book about how many of the charges the prosecutor presents to the grand jury the information and if he's selective or omits anything then who knows what the grand jury how the story was conveyed to them and it seems that it's not conveyed very very well in terms of this prosecution because there's no charges laid or there's no successful conviction yeah that was shown uh, in kentucky a couple of years ago Breonna, uh, a woman was Taylor. shot in her house, shot in bed by police, clearly who made an entry into the house because they thought there was somebody bad there, shot her, killed her, clearly done uh, improperly. They had improper orders. They did things improperly, went to the grand jury. The grand jury found that they are not guilty of anything. And that was then presented to the public that, see, that they didn't do anything. And one of the grand jurors, because they're not supposed to say anything, so outraged by it, he said, yeah, the reason we didn't find any of the police guilty is because the uh, district attorney 
But the attorney general, the state, didn't offer us that opportunity. All they asked us about was, are they guilty of shooting into the wrong department? And a bullet went into the adjacent department. Yeah, there was somebody guilty of shooting into the wrong apartment. But they weren't even uh, given the opportunity to evaluate whether or not any of the police officers who did the shooting should um, uh, be found guilty of anything because the district attorney didn't present it to them, which was unknown. The public thought that the, the reason that they were found not guilty was because they found that they, what they did was reasonable. They didn't find it reasonable. They didn't have. So, and I think that an awful lot happens in the grand jury, especially in the, these kind of cases that should not be hidden from public view. And England, I think, stopped the grand, secret grand juries almost 100 years ago. They stopped. We inherited it in colonial days from, uh, from England. Yeah. England has found that it serves no useful purpose and that it hides, it can hide a lot of misbehavior by prosecutors who are out there to protect police that they work with every day. Absolutely. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Michael Baden, for coming on and talking about your extraordinary American autopsy, one medical examiner's decades-long fight for racial justice in a broken legal system. It's truly extraordinary story chronicling your an incredible career as a forensic pathologist and also a fighter for civil rights and for justice. And I want to applaud you on this extraordinary book, American Autopsy, One Medical Examiner's Decades-Long Fight for Racial Justice in a Broken Legal System. I want to thank you very much for this interview, Dr. Michael Baden. Dan, thank you for having me. Thank you, and you have a great evening. You too. Bye. Good night. Good night.